You're welcome back. This is News Files, your most authoritative news analysis show. I'm your host, Samson Ladi and Yenene, and I've got three of my guests seated already in the studio. Uh, today we are doing an editor's edition. We're talking to uh, getting the perspectives of editors, hosts, and analysts. I mean, not the ordinary ones. Um, people with sufficient enough experience who will also assist us to break down all the matters that have been on the front pages of your mind in the course of the week in a manner that we trust. You'll get to appreciate them a lot more. And uh, hopefully, uh, say them without any inhibitions where the views require uh, them to be as blunt as uh, the situation requires them to do without looking back and looking on the, over their shoulders. Right, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's time for my take, but this is what I do. I just do a quick, um, something I don't do, a quick reaction to a, what I did last week and reserve the time for the rest of the discussion. My take is actually a dedicated five minutes. It's only five minutes, but it's supposed to be precious five minutes when I take an issue of importance and give it a legal, you know, uh, talk, talk to you about the legal implications and to seek to give you education, legal education about an issue. So it is the reason my take is always about law. Um, a good dose of the law is good. A bit of it for you in your pocket also can help you. So that's basically what I do. <clears throat> so uh, it takes me time to research the law and to ensure that within the five minutes, I compress my views, which are basically legal positions of, of Ghana particularly and also elsewhere. <clears throat> so I hardly would have any feedback and seek to react to them. I hardly do get feedback on them. That is a criticism or a negative. And this job, we survive on feedback. So I take all feedback. If you have met me before and you have done the cliche, you're doing a good job, you would always be sure that I'll ask you that question. What is it that I do that you don't like? And that's a feedback I normally ask people to give. Now, there is a number of a number of guys, particularly uh, who are Ghanaians who live outside of the country, particularly in the U.S., and they do criticism of a lot of things that happen. That's very good, and we take all the feedback. But when I write law, and you are clueless about the law, and you seek to project your social appreciation in a manner to suggest that the law is wrong, I will not let you go with that wrong impression and infect other people with it. So there are a couple of professors, professors, they are based in the U.S., and they write to criticize almost everything in this country. Sometimes very good opinions, you use them. But <clears throat> on this occasion, and I'll not name the person, writes a lot on the Ghana web, and he knows himself. Now, his view is a view I'll not ignore, because last week I shared that the victim of the Midland Savings and Loans assault is grateful for what has happened to her. Myself, together with lawyers for Midland Savings and Loans, sat together, we drafted a, a settlement agreement so that we don't sue Midland Savings and Loans for civil you know, damages and for compensation for her. The criminal process is going on. So I mentioned that she's grateful for what has happened to her. She's thankful and is even forgiving, and I'm prepared to join her to be forgiving. However, the criminal prosecution is going on. And she's, as yesterday, she went to the Kaswa area behind the CAF University with her family to inspect a two-bedroom uh, semi-detached uh, property. That's what she's gotten, and some amount of money in her account as well to start up any business that she deems fit. She's now moving from the kiosk into a home for herself and her family for forever. She owns it. She's a house owner. She's a landlord. And then also... Um, she moves from toffee selling to doing good business, dignified life, so to speak. And the criticism has been that, I mean, it's a rare one, has been that um, we have gone to settle something for her and to not allow the law to work. And that uh, in the U.S., uh, she could get even more than that by suing. Please, you are so ignorant that you won't have this happening in the U.S. Now, the courts have a way of determining how much compensation anybody gets. She hasn't suffered any permanent disability. 
So she's not, she's not in a situation where she cannot continue her business and do her work, and her dependents cannot, cannot continue to survive. So there will be no basis, really, to give her compensation in a suit that will be more than what she's gotten, which will amount to about 60,000 US dollars, if you, if you put a value to all of it. So I'm sorry, you're so wrong, and you need to keep, you know, open your mind and to, 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 to be taught in the law. The law actually allows settlements. This is a civil aspect, the criminal aspect will go on. It is only Midland Savings and Loans that has, you know, as it were, bought its way out of a lawsuit. And this is what I call a generous package. So the law allows settlements to be done. And when they are done, they are good. In fact, if we were supposed to proceed to go ahead and sue, this is our law firm that was going to do that job on our fees and everything. There's no fee to it because we use our own resources and do all of that. It could take quite a long time. And in the end, how much may you have gotten? If you, even if you got 20,000 US equivalent, that would be quite a bit. And how much will that, you know, um, even do after a long time? So please, what she has gotten is, I can say, without any equivocation, far more than what she would have gotten if she had mounted a civil suit. Thank you very much. That's good education for you. Take it. Uh, the criminal process will go on nonetheless. Okay, so my guests are here. Uh, ben Epson is managing editor of the Daily Dispatch newspaper. Um, I checked, and it does appear that you haven't been on news file as in in the studio for almost a decade. Yes. That's a long time. Yes. You guys used to run the show to our admiration yes. because it used to be an editor's forum, so to speak. Yes. Right. So how does it feel? I mean, coming back into studio, I've, I've interviewed you a couple of times, though. Yeah. You know, it makes you feel that, look, once now, once you've done it before, it's always good to go back on it. Mm. That's it, yeah. Okay. Also here in the studio is Paul Adum Otre, his host, Good Evening Ghana and has been a news reporter for a very long time. He's unapologetic about his views, very strong views he has to share always. Paul, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Great so, to yes, have I'm you. I'm particularly happy to see Ben Epson. I've not seen him in a very long time. Okay. And as a reporter, he was of great help to me every now and then. I'll check stories with him. Do you still operate the office in Laboni, Ben? Yeah. Okay, I, I used to go there on a daily basis. Hmm. I'll resume my visits to your office, Ben. You're always welcome. Right. <laughs> and here also is Evans Mensa. He's editor. Joy News has been doing this job for quite a long while. Evans, welcome to the show. Sasha, thank you very much. About two weeks ago, is it? You were here. Right where yeah, I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I was somewhere enjoying you. Yeah, chilling. Right. Great. Yeah. Okay. So we will be going on the phone lines. We'll be speaking to a financial consultant who has different and new perspectives revealing about the banking crisis. Emmanuel Akron is a financial consultant. He will join us on the phone as we deal with the issues of finance um, on Skype as we deal with the issues on the financial situation with the financial institutions in the country as the two collapsed long before and then now five of them have been collapsed and um, brought into what is called the consolidated uh, bank um, consolidated bank ghana we'll ask a couple of questions and also look at uh, comparative analysis what has happened elsewhere and whether or not Ghana is actually doing the right thing. Uh, the thumbs up that the Bank of Ghana is receiving, um, is it really, is it genuine or it is not? They say that they, there was no any other option. This was the only option allowed by law that they could take. Are they right or they are wrong? We'll answer those questions in the next few minutes. Now, let's uh, get to listen to the governor of the Bank of Ghana who is now being a judge by some persons like Ace and Kuma and others as the man of the year. Quality review of banks conducted by the Bank of Ghana in 2015 and updated in 2016 identified a few indigenous banks as vulnerable with inadequate capital, high levels of non-performing loans, and weak corporate governance. 
In August 2016, the bank closed two of those banks. This is the UT Bank and Capital Bank, and approved the acquisition by GCB Bank of some of their assets and liabilities under a purchase and assumption agreement. Other banks that were more recently licensed in 2016 and also commencing operations in 2017 also began showing signs of distress due to existing vulnerabilities that were not disclosed at the time of their licensing. Efforts by these banks to extricate themselves from financial difficulty have not borne fruit. The situation has rather worsened for these banks. Beige Bank and Construction Bank were each granted provisional licenses in 2016 and launched in 2017. Subsequent investigations conducted by the Bank of Ghana revealed that similar to the case of Sovereign Bank, both banks obtained their banking licenses under false pretenses using suspicious and non-existent capital, which has resulted in a situation in which their reported capital is inaccessible to them for their operations. In the case of Sovereign Bank Limited, as part of Bank of Ghana's investigations, into the failure of Capital Bank Limited, currently in receivership, it emerged that Sovereign Bank's license was obtained by false pretenses through the use of suspicious and non-existent capital. The bank is insolvent and unable to meet daily liquidity obligations falling due. Liquidity support granted so far to the bank amounts to 21 million asset 31st July 2018. The bank has not been able to publish its audited accounts for December 2017 in violation of Section 90 of Act 930. In the case of Royal Bank, an on-site examination conducted by the Bank of Ghana on 31st March 2018 revealed a number of irregularities. Its non-performing loans constituted 78.8% of loans granted, owing to poor credit risk and liquidity risk management controls. A number of the bank's transactions, totaling 161.9 million CDs, were entered into with shareholders, related and connected parties, structured to circumvent single obligo limits conceal related party exposure limits, and overstate the capital position of the bank for the purpose of complying with the capital adequacy requirement. That they can, they, 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 they can pursue within the court system or any other means that are lawfully allowed. We would also be able to pass on all the findings of our, our investigation so far uh, to the appropriate state agencies that are mandated to to investigate and to prosecute if need if if uh, if warranted. So what we know is that there is a lot of um, a lot of wrongdoing on the part of individuals that that contributed to the collapse of these companies. And we will not stop at revoking their licenses. We would ensure that we pass on to the appropriate quarters what um, needs to be followed up through, and we will be judgment. You said you are, you are passing on these documents of investigations done so far. When is this handing over being done? Who are you handing them over to? Well, that's still work that's ongoing, like I said. We've just appointed a receiver yesterday in the person of Mr. Nia Manodoju. We're going to be working with them so that they can pursue all the civil uh, options that are uh, civil law options available to them, going to court and all of that. Uh, they would also take steps to report to the appropriate quarters, guided by you know the findings of all the reports we have so far, so that you know the appropriate appropriate agencies take uh, take up these matters. When we're going to do that? As soon as possible.
uh, there are certain players within the banking supervision departments of the Bank of Ghana who need to be examined. And the bank has to do its internal review and clean out all the bad nuts that were there. You cannot issue a fraudulent license unless you collude with the bank of the, the, uh, the, the supervision department of the central bank. And those persons also have to be identified and prosecuted. Um, I'm going to ask the Minister of Finance and the Governor of Bank of Ghana to appear before Parliament to give us um, better and further particulars about this um, um, 5.7 billion and, and if there's any way government of Ghana can take any action to reduce the fiscal cost to the state because 5.7 billion Ghana cities isn't a small man who's not doing that. Who are the chunk? I mean the main customers, the big ticket. We had Cocoa Board, 222 million. We, 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 we had um, Road Fund, another um, uh, 300 and something million. We, we, we had Ministry of Finance themselves. So um, from what I read, Government of Ghana and its allied agencies put together, you're talking about a billion. Is that all or there are more? Right, so the discussion already started in the studio <laughs> where you have not been privy to. Um, you get to hear what have been expressed already behind closed doors later, I hope. Now, we will straight away go to the phone lines. You, you heard the governor of the Bank of Ghana. You heard also the deputy governor on, you know, potential prosecutions. You heard Sidney um, Kisley Hifford on the need for prosecutions and including to extend to officials of the Bank of Ghana and then you had uh, Kessel Atto Forcing who uh, spoke on summoning the Bank of Ghana boss and finance minister over the development. Atto Forcing is a minority spokesperson on on finance and former deputy minister of finance. Now, let's get straight to the phone lines and speak to Emmanuel Akron, who is a financial uh, consultant. He's um, often here in the country and also in Canada as well. Uh, good morning, Emmanuel, and thank you very much for joining us. Okay, I, I, I can hear he's speaking, but I can't. I can't. Uh, I hear his lips moving uh, in the in the in the Skype, but uh, we can't hear anything, right? Hello, Emmanuel. Let's try again. Yes, yes, you're on now. You're on now. Good morning. Good morning. Right. Now. now I'd like us to plunge straight into looking at the, the issues from a certain broader perspective. The Bank of Ghana, among other, other things, said that the Bank of Ghana has since requested the bank shareholders to recapitalize it to the minimum capital required. I'm making a quotation in respect of one of the banks. The Bank of Ghana has since re requested the bank's shareholders, shareholder, to recapitalize it to the minimum capital required at the time of its licensing. While the shareholder submitted plans to the Bank of Ghana, these plans have not yielded any success. Now, they say this in respect of one of the banks. Then you find that this is almost the situation with almost all the banks, that they were giving opportunity as they were, being, they were getting capital and liquidity support um, to be able to fulfill the obligations as they fell due and yet things were getting bad, according to the report that the Bank of Ghana received and the communication it has made to us. Now, if it is the case that, as we know, they have submitted plans and the Bank of Ghana could assist them, could those, I mean, those that essentially required liquidity to survive, not be given a bailout and monitored, regulated, to survival and growth, as we may have seen in the, in the Nigerian case, where they did what they call the, the Project Alpha Initiative, where the, the state supported eight banks that were collapsing to survive. Okay, so, uh, should I go ahead? Hello? Okay, it doesn't appear that the internet uh, connection is the best. 
um, we may have to try. And uh, if we could get, just get him straight on telephone, uh, so we, we may manage that instead. If we could get him straight on telephone to see um, where the Bank of Ghana clearly says that there was no other option left to it. And this was the only option they had. The question I'm asking is, what they have done, is it not essentially a bailout? The Bank of Ghana says there were no other feasible options in line with the relevant law. So my major question to start this discussion is, is that really accurate? What they have done, is it, does it not amount to a bailout of sort by uh, recapitalizing the, the, the consolidated bank using and then taking the good assets and making sure that it's able to operate. Was that not possible with the banks that have been collapsed, or some of them at least, by way of changing the management and shareholders, for example, and um, also, you know, continuing in that direction? Yes, since we don't, we don't have uh, Emmanuel on the line now, may I start with uh, Paul? Yeah, thank you very much, Thompson. Right. And uh, good morning to morning. your viewers. Yeah. I'll, I'll come to that question uh, because I think there's some evidence in the work that KPMG did mm. uh, in which they put out some options for the government. And uh, we, we are not too sure whether that formed part of the consideration of the governor's press conference. But after the governor's press conference, I was particularly worried that having uh, so brilliantly expressed what, what he wants to do and seemed to be um, protecting the public in, in the way that he presented himself, he did not discuss a major question about the whole episode, which is the dereliction of duty of the Bank of Ghana itself. He did not mention it. Now, because if he doesn't mention that, he leaves us in the middle of the street where we don't know when this will recur, when we don't know whether this will occur another time, because he's not been able to tell us that these things occurred because the Bank of Ghana's supervisory jurisdiction or the people who implement that were derelict in their duty, and so we have put these mechanisms in place, and these things will not happen again. If you look at the law, and that's what I want to stay on, yeah. the Act um, 930, which is the, um, the Bank Specialized Deposit Taking Act. When Parliament passed the Act in 2016, they said in Section 2 that this Act is elevated over the company's code. And that's a very serious matter in any country. It says what does that, that mean? It says that where there is a conflict of inconsistency, between the Companies Act 1963 as 179 and this act, this act shall prevail. That's, that's, that's a very serious matter. So that the Companies Code that sort of regulates all companies is inferior to Act 930 where they have a conflict. So the, the governor and the people who have the responsibility to implement this act must understand the relationship they have with the society and deal with it accordingly. In fact, in the Section 3 of, of, the, of the act, it says in Section 3D that the Bank of Ghana shall have supervisory responsibility. And one of the things they are supposed to do is to develop appropriate consumer protection measures to ensure that the interest of clients of the banks and the specialized deposit-taking institutions are adequately protected. That, that's, that's an important aspect of the, of, the, of, the, of the law. It doesn't appear that the governor, in making the presentation about the things that happened, said anything about what had happened at the bank. Yeah. If, you, if you look at other aspects of the law, there's section six, for instance. If you can quickly yeah. state the okay. reason you speak to the question mm -hmm. of this law, its provisions being elevated over the company's uh, law, which is, you know, first in time. Yes, because... W what's the purpose of the that purpose reference? Is, is about the, the purpose is about the fiduciary responsibility that has been placed on these people, the higher responsibility that has been placed on those who implement Act 930. Because it has to do with money, and it has to do with people putting their money in a trusted system, a bank. And therefore, the, the, the parliament in this wisdom was thinking that, let's elevate the standard even above the company law, mm. so that even where there's a conflict, let this one prevail. That's, that's what I think they didn't recognize, or they have not recognized, or they didn't express in that press conference, by telling us how these things occurred. If you look at the law, these things could not have occurred without a collusion from the bank. There was pure, clearly dereliction of, perhaps collusion is a strong word, so let me change it, and say that there was dereliction of duty. There was an obvious dereliction of duty. If you look at Section 9, what the bank has to do, for instance, the things they should check, how they find out whether somebody promising that I have this money had it. The bank, the, 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 the act says all of that, how in detail they should, they should go to find out. So they can't tell us, for instance, that somebody obtained a license by false pretenses. Mm. How did you find out? 
and when you found out, what did you do? There's another aspect of the law that he didn't say anything about, and it's in Section 16 about the revocation of license. Okay, these, so, these so let's, no, no, let's hold, hold on to Section important. 16. I'm coming. No, let's hold to Section yeah. 16. You return to deal with it. Yes, you have important. time to deal with the, the the matters in the manner you you wish to in a most exhaustive way. Fair so enough. don't worry Fair at all. Except that just that small bit about the parliament itself saying that this law is elevated yes, over yes, the yes. company's law. Clearly. I mean, by, by, by way of a natural order, mm -hmm. if a law is passed mm -hmm. and one is latest in time, mm -hmm. its content, if they conflict with another law, mm -hmm. which is, you know, uh, far remote in time, Mm -hmm. The one that is later in time will overcome that one. Yes. So they didn't even need to express that. No, but that's why but they... So, so when they express that, of right. course, I mean, the point you're making is general. Right. Even though the Constitution has other ideas about it in terms of the Constitution being the supreme law of the land. Great. The reason why Parliament expressed that was to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. Because what you are talking about is common law. Okay. You are, you are speaking at common law. Right. Thank and you. And they that, are speaking let, let, at Let's get to Emmanuel. Parliament. We'll come back. Yes. yes. <laughs> let's get to Emmanuel. I, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, good morning. Uh, some, um, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Very good. Thank you very much. And thanks and good for... Good morning to your listeners. Um, I'm happy to join you people this morning. And um, hopefully uh, you guys have enough time for me to um, go into the issues, I mean, step by step. We, we do. <laughs> because um, we, I, I, I yeah. like to give a very a comprehensive assessment of all this. Great. So uh, the, anyway, question asking, question. the question I was um, asking... The question I was asking to start I, I heard your question. If Great. If I could paraphrase it. Great. You, Initially, you wanted to find out whether there were other options except for consolidating of these banks, or in other words, could they have saved um, these five banks instead of, um, um, I mean, um, revoking their licenses? Is right. that your initial question? That's right. Okay. Can you hear me? Clearly. Okay, that's fine. So let me go to them, um, to each of them, and I, I, will, I will express also my general view about the actions taken. So first of all, um, I think um, the new Bank of Ghana has, I think, amended at, and, I mean, 918, um, I mean, Section 53A, I mean, says that you should only be giving um, liquidity support uh, to companies who have liquidity challenge but they are solvent, okay? So um, to the extent that any of those companies were insolvent, I think um, you can't go to um, liquidity support. Um, so the names of Unibank um, um, and um, Royal Bank, um, um, you couldn't, I mean, have continued to keep them alive because um, Section 123 of, I think, at 930 specifically says that if a bank is um, so insolvent, um, you shall do this. You shall revoke the alliance. So there's no, I mean, I mean, I know sometimes shall mean something else, but mm -hmm. I think um, going strictly by the, 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 um, the letter of the law, it means Bank of Ghana has no option. If it's just, um, it was clearly determined that um, Unibank and um, Royal uh, Bank, Royal Bank, Bank, were, Bank. Were, 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 were insolvent. So okay. that is my first take on it. So the in fact, Unibank, were, were Royal Bank, Bank, Bank and Beige um, Bank were described as and deeply and insolvent, not just insolvent. Option available. Hello? Yes, I was saying that, in fact, Unibank, Royal Bank, and Big Bank were described as deeply insolvent, not just insolvent. Yes. So, yes. Yes. what so, you're so saying... That's what I'm saying, that they are beyond those rescue. three banks, um, um, you couldn't go to give them life support using liquidity, um, liquidity because the liquidity support in accordance with 53 says you can't, should give it to solvent banks. So, I mean, the only way out is to go to um, Section 123, of at 930 and put them into um, what we call the liquidation that they've been put under. Um, I have a different take on um, as, um, construction bank and surveying bank. Um, so if you clearly read surveying bank and um, construction bank, um, they were not really, I mean, insolvent. Um, I mean, technically, what Bank of Ghana is saying is that um, fictitious or non-existent capital was submitted. Um, um, for those two. Uh, for me, looking at the business model of those two banks, I, in my personal opinion, they should have been kept alive. Uh, Bank of Ghana exercising its right under the Act could have, I mean, in my view, um, given um, another shareholder. And luckily, the Ministry of Finance said, I mean, laid out a criteria that if you are a solvent, well-run bank, 
you could come to me for 400 million. So I don't understand why they could they didn't give a, a, a Sovereign Bank and Construction Bank that option to access 400 million from the Ministry of Finance and kick out to the shareholders. Okay. Are you so are you taking my, note? Are you taking note that you, are you taking note? Is it Royal and Sovereign? Are you adding Construction Bank as well? No, no, no. So, so, so. Okay, no. because Construction so, Bank all, was already all, winding up. First of all, first of all, I said that um, Unibank and Royal Bank are insolvent. Those should be liquidated okay. according to the law. Okay. Now I'm talking about Construction Bank and Sovereign Bank. They are not insolvent. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is that those two banks should have kept been kept alive. Okay. And you, I mean, go ahead and give them 400 million each from. Like the government said, they have 400 million available. So those, that, that, that's a distinction. That okay, so that's where I was pointing out to you. If you say the construction bank, for example, was not insolvent and therefore could mm -hmm. have uh, gotten a rescue, um, mm -hmm. what do you make of the fact that construction bank itself, I hope I'm not uh, mixing up any facts, was mm -hmm. already winding up? Um, it was winding up. That, um, so you guys put up a new, uh, the news on that, and uh, and the reason given was the fact that um, I mean time was running out. A shareholder could I um, is unable to give um, the, um, the money um, for the four hundred. So okay. I mean they have no um, option. You see the reason why you see this um, the, the reason why they are winding up supports my reason because if they couldn't pay all their liabilities, okay from what they have, they won't be winding up. Because, I mean, they definitely, I mean, they won't have the asset to wind down, okay? So I think they were very confident. They had the resources to wind it down, okay? All that they are trying to tell you is that they don't have the 400 million, because to be a bank, I mean, effective September 11, 2017, you need 400 million. Mm. And they had grace period up to December 31st, 2018. So all that they are trying to tell you is that we don't have that much to continue Okay, and our sole shareholder, I mean, is I mean, uh, conflicted in this uni uh, unibank case and all that. So, um, the best that we can do to protect the integrity of the of the uh, the people, um, the, I mean, that out there, which I know they were good people, um, is to kind of go and wind down the company. So, in my view, I think they took proactive steps. I mean, I mean, to 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 do the right thing, which means they were solvent. I mean, they had the resources to. Pay all your liabilities. Um, I mean, I mean, and, and, and get out of the way. Right. Um, in, so in, I think we need to draw the distinction between the five banks. Okay. okay. Um, the three of them were insolvent. I mean, you have to apply the law. Two of them, you could keep them alive. Okay. And I um, mean, get new shareholders into that. All right. And so and, and from the from that, the bank of Ghana's own from the bank of Ghana's own perspective, we need to emphasize mm -hmm. that the three of them were said to be deeply insolvent, not just insolvent. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yes. <laughs> those, those are, I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I agree with That you. tells you a degree yeah, of that's insolvency. I keep on saying that they had no option. Bank mm. of Ghana has no option because the act, if you read the act carefully, mm. it said the HR, even it's not even when you are insolvent, when you are anticipated to be insolvent even in 60 days, they can close you down. Okay. okay? So... I don't want to debate that. I right. mean, that is a settled law. Right. The law says they should do that. Right. They don't have any option than to do what they did. So right. Those who were said to be deeply we insolvent. We don't even discuss those actions. They those who were said actions. to be deeply insolvent included the Unibank. The, yeah. the, the, the information, again, as we have known, <clears throat> is, is that Unibank's shareholders and uh, management and so forth had pledged that they were putting together resources that would be sufficient enough, enough to keep them, you know, beyond the point of being described as insolvent. Would, would that then have been prudent to allow them the space to do that? Um, honestly, um, I think I agree with the Bank of Ghana, action, and I'm going to explain why. You see, I will, I will go through each of the issues that is raised in, the, um, in regard to Unibank. So one of the things that Bank of Ghana has objective is to maintain the sanity of the system and to protect I mean, um, depositors and financial stability, okay? Let me be blunt here. The actions of Unibank, as described in the report, makes the shareholders and management unfit to run the bank. Mm. It's as simple as that, 
Okay? <laughs> so I don't honestly buy the idea that you should allow them to put in any money. Okay? Um, I mean, technically, I mean, and I, I let me deviate a little bit here. There were people involved with Capital Bank who were allowed to go behind some other banks and some other institutions. I found that very unfortunate. Those people should have been declared unfit to run any institution. Mm. Okay? So, I mean, I'll go further than what Bank of Ghana has said. I mean, those people shouldn't be allowed to handle any financial institution. That's it's as simple as that. Okay? The fit and proper directive that Bank of Ghana has issued, those guys don't fit to run any financial institution. But I think if you permit me to kind of elaborate a little bit on Unibank, because I think, see, I, I like your listeners to get a full perspective on this whole thing, because I, I, I feel that I, I think we have half of the reports of what has happened in the public, and I don't think um, we're doing um, Unibank executives the justice enough. Um, or we do, we, I, I feel there are kind of no uh, equity is not settled here. We only know p uh, part of the uh, people who did this, okay? And I paraphrased this to your colleague Evans yesterday, and I don't know whether it was Ed, but what I started by saying was that look into a situation where you've seen a driver who has killed somebody um, by crossing a red light. You mm. just got a report that the guy ran through a red light and killed somebody. You, got, you, you guys are, I mean, I mean, angry about a driver, but what you guys don't know, okay, the report that has not been made public to you guys is the fact that the driver in this case has crossed the red light 11 times. Hmm. And this was just the 11th time the driver was just going through to kill somebody. And the policeman allowed him. So what you guys don't have is the fact that what role did the policeman play in all this? Okay, in my personal opinion, 90% of the situation we've seen in Unibank and Royal Bank can be laid on the full steps of Bank of Ghana and the auditors, okay? I only give 10% to Unibank, okay? I've experienced credit crisis in the U.S. before. I saw this, and I know where these things come from, okay? It was clearly regulatory and um, auditors, I mean, it should happen here, okay? Um, giving human being chance, okay? L look at Unibank. You allowed Unibank to access liquidity fund for more than five times. Each time they were not paying, okay? And it, it, it totaled to $2.2 billion. Come on. Are you, are you, I mean, you guys in the studio, are you going to give somebody a loan? Five times the guy didn't pay, okay? So I think Bank of God, I mean, this report, I, I think it's half of the story. I mean, I've experienced banks who were in liquidity support in other places before. When the, um, the regulator give you liquidity support, they send their guys to your office. All your clearance, the people you are paying, has to be deposited, not giving loans. Okay, so Bank of Ghana, when you gave them those 2.2, did you just leave them to just use the 2.2 anyhow? Okay? All and right. giving, I mean, any human being opportunity. The human being will do the wrong thing. I mean, let, let me deviate a little bit. Paul said in the Bible that there's nothing good in me as Paul. When I want to do good, bad is in front of me. Human being naturally, we, I mean, tell me who, who is a saint, okay? That's why we have the laws. That's why the laws are supposed to work. And in this case, the, 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 the people who are supposed to ensure that the right thing was done, drop the ball, my friend. They dropped the ball. Okay? I mean, in Chile, you guys have something. I, I wonder, Kawa, if you to me, hmm. there's no robbery that will happen without an insider help. Okay? There's nothing. These guys at Unibank couldn't have done what they've done without support from somebody in the central bank and the auditors. Okay? Let me deviate a little bit and go back to the line system. If you look at Big Capital, you look at um, Bear Star, you look at um, uh, construction and stuff, like how could all this thing happen? They are no coincidence. Okay? Non-existent capital. Okay? Like your listener, I mean, Paul was trying to illustrate all the things that I mean, the, the Act 9, I mean, uh, Section 9 of the Act required. What due diligence was made? Okay? In all these cases. So, I mean, in summary, I think what I've, I've told people is that what you guys have in the public domain is half of the story. And mm. I think it's 10% of what caused the situation. 90% of what caused the situation, you guys don't know. Mm. And that's why I've en um, encouraged, I'm encouraging the Ministry of Finance and the Parliamentary Select Committee on Finance to set up an independent board, okay? Independent 
a consultant or auditor to look into this situation from the end to end, okay, so that these things cannot happen again. Okay. When I experienced these things in the U.S. and uh, other places, what happened was that you can't, in, I, mean, the, I mean, Bank of Ghana is conflicted in this case. You can't rely on Bank of Ghana report entirely alone to make a conclusion. Mm. You need an independent assessment of what happened, and you guys don't have that. Okay, all right. that's very unfortunate, mm. and it, they should be on air to explain all the end to end. Okay, it's easy to point figures. Okay, that the guy who ran through the red light and killed somebody, but what you guys don't have is the um, the, the, the part that the policeman played in allowing this guy to run through the red light nine times, mm. nine times, the, not once, nine times. Right. Okay? Now, if you go to Bank of Ghana financial statement right. for 2017, they have 4.7 billion. Okay, or they gave loans to banks for almost eight point six billion. It, it Bank does, of Ghana itself, it, it does look like of that mm. amount is gone bad. It does look Tell like me, there's a trend in to watch. In with the law, mm. they were supposed to collect collateral to be able to give this emergency fund. The collateral they have for this four point seven billion is six hundred million. Mm. So, it, in, in in effect, probably the two point two that um, billion that is given to. Um, um, Unibank, Bank of Ghana already have collateral of 600 million, which is, in co uh, which is not in accordance with the law. Okay. Th 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 there's, there's, there's this issue. To give liquidity fund, you've got to support with collateral. So Bank of Ghana itself was giving money to Unibank in not in accordance with the law. If I have to look at it from a face value on your okay. financial statement. Th there's, this issue, there's this issue that's been raised. And if you look at what the Bank of Ghana uh, spoke about, for example, Unibank has said that um, it had a capital adequacy ratio of negative 74.65% compared to the regulatory minimum of 10%. Now, the question is, did they, were they involved, were the managers and shareholders who, according to the Bank of Ghana again, had their assets significant portion of their asset locked up in interest-free loans and other advances to the shareholders and related parties. Questions are being raised as though there is a crime when you invest the monies, I'm using very ordinary parlance understanding, when you invest money that has come to you as, as, as an operator of a bank. Can you explain that to us? What is wrong with receiving depositors funds and knowing that you want to invest it somewhere make more money and then pay them back when they they, they fall due what is wrong with that okay so let, let me explain thanks for your question so i think this is very important i think you've raised a valid issue here i think what people need to understand is that there are a lot of things at stake in unibank at this point there are things i'll call bad banking practices they yeah, are not unlawful. The people should distinguish between what is bad, bad banking practices, what were unlawful activities in accordance with the law, and what was clearly a fraud, which will have to be determined by a law court. Mm. Okay, so people should be reframe. I, I will encourage people and your, your, your editors, everybody should refrain from using the word fraud. It has to be established by a law court, by intent of what they've done, okay? We don't, we've not reached there yet. We only have what Bank of Ghana is saying. So yeah. I think the first thing is that some of the actions of Unibank are, or, I mean, from a bank, I'm a banker. From a banking standpoint, doesn't make a, a business sense, okay? And some of them, too, were not in accordance with Act 930. So okay. I think there were due processes that, yeah, I mean, going back to back bad banking practices, you don't lock... Your, your, your entire funds in some illiquid, I mean, money, okay? And, um, and what they've done, okay, is to lock a lot of the uh, depositors money in um, um, liquidity, um, what's the name, um, um, illiquid, um, I mean, um, like real estate and all that, okay? Mo that act those actions are what I'll call bad, bad, uh, bad pra uh, practices. If you do that, you've locked yourself up and eventually you, okay. you have liquidity challenges. Right, um, so, so my final um, question you, to you... you have liquidity challenges, right. I think... Um, my my um, final I mean, question to you, sir, will be... My final question to you will be to look at my, what's, what the ahead. bigger plan will be. Um, in Nigeria, for example, we know that 
in 2008, they had a crisis in the banking sector. They introduced the Project Alpha initiative to reform the banks. We are told about how, you know, in 2004, they began to require uh, to do consolidation program, which uh, was necessitated by the need to strengthen the banks. The policy trust, we are told at inception, was to grow the banks and position them to play pivotal roles in driving development across the sectors uh, of the economy. As a result, banks were consolidated through mergers and acquisitions, raising the capital base from 2 billion naira to a minimum of 25 billion naira almost mimicking the situation, we, 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 we seem to be mimicking their situation, 150 to 400. Now, in Nigeria, this is what we are told happened. Now, that reduced the number of the banks from 89 to 25 in 2005, and subsequently reducing the banks to 24. We are told that, as we said, the banks in Nigeria have created a formidable front so that now some of them can compete equally with some of the international banks that you speak about. What do you see to be the broader plan? We, do we have a, a blueprint in Ghana, or we are doing an ad hoc you know, situation of uh, fire, firefighting rescue? Um, I think uh, I will answer your question in, in a way that, oh, I mean, as you rightly introduced me, I'm a consultant and I do frequently visit Ghana. I consult for a number of institutions, even I, I sometimes read the regulators and some of the banks and also the Ministry of Finance. I'm privy to a lot of um, some information and some are not public and I, I would not want to go into it. But um, let me first uh, tell you that there are broader plans in place. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know why things have not been made public at the moment. But I think behind the scenes, there are broader plans that have been worked upon. I mean, without going to those broader plans to, I mean, uh, that would negate my non-disclosure agreement, let me give you my perspective, okay, on what I think the way forward are. Yeah, do that briefly for us, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way forward, I think, is first of all, like I said initially, is to establish an independent body to, establish, uh, to, to understand what really went on, okay, not only with this five banks we stay in, but with UT and Capital Bank. By independent That's body, what are you talking about? Come again. By independent body, what are you requiring? So I'm talking about independent inquiry committee. So some kind of um, investigation not done, not, not um, carried out by Bank of Ghana itself, but, but carried by independent um, auditor, I mean, or um, consultant, I mean, under the control of uh, Parliament and Ministry of Finance to get an end-to-end -end understanding of what has led to all the situation that we find ourselves in, okay? okay. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is to restructure our regulatory uh, framework. So as we speak now, Bank of Ghana has these um, two things that they are doing. They have the monetary policy and the prudential. I feel strongly with all these things that's happening that we need to go to the Australian model where um, Bank of Ghana focus on its uh, monetary policy and um, we leave the prudential to a separate body and bring in the um, insurance and uh, I mean other regulatory under that body and carry it independently. And within that framework, we'll have to set up a coordinated body um, like we have it um, elsewhere called the Financial Stability Committee to coordinate among these bodies to ensure that um, information is flowing effortlessly among the body and, and also to share uh, systematic risk issues. Okay, so that's, I mean, for me, the All second right. stick. The third stick is to, I mean, uh, have a, group, I mean, a, 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 a blueprint of a supervisory framework uh, um, um, in Bank of Ghana. You see, most of these things is happening. I think uh, an iron hand is being used, a macho hand is being used. I keep on telling people that what, I mean, I mean Nigeria may not be necessarily a blueprint for us. I, I mean, I, I don't subscribe to Nigeria as uh, the, 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 the model that we should be using. I, I normally look up to countries like Kenya in Africa, okay, they have, I mean, you look at how Kenya have developed in the financial service sector, Rwanda is even going up, and, and also even South Africa. So I will look at those models, okay? Let's, let, let's not restrict ourselves too much, okay? okay? That will also stifle, I mean, entrepreneurship and innovations, okay? All there right. are so many things going on, mm. and I think what, I think Bank of Ghana objective in line with 
I mean, the, the, the Bank of Ghana Act is not only what they're doing, they have also to promote economic um, stability and economic development. So right. some of these actions, could they have done it earlier? I mean, what they've done, I mean, I mean is it a, a restoring um, I mean, trust in the financial sector? All those benchmark has to be, people have to debate about it. Because okay. I feel strongly some of these actions should have been taken far earlier and wouldn't have been in this situation. Because as I speak to you now, it's not only local banks which are going to suffer. In, um, people don't, at the moment, people don't trust the financial sector. I mean, they don't trust what they are hearing. Okay, so they are not taking their money and putting it under their, I mean, into a, a, from a local to a foreign bank. They are putting it under their bed. Okay. So I think, I think some of these actions, in my view, I mean, it's too late, but it's, it's, it's a way forward. But I think it's the beginning. We need more actions. We need right. an independent auditor's board. All right. Okay, auditors right now in the country. Thank you. I mean, nobody, I mean, some, I mean, they are conflicted in the way they are being Thank supervised. you, Emmanuel I recommend an independent board to supervise the auditors. Thank okay. you so I'm very much, Emmanuel Lacron. Uh, Emmanuel Lacron uh, is uh, a financial you consultant, can. and you heard him express uh, very important views there, including the way forward and looking at, you know, a sustained, rather, uh, plan, and including looking for a commission of sort to audit the situation so that we don't come back to these issues. Now, I'll get to Paul to finish developing the point that he had started. And the reference I made to Emmanuel Cron in Nigeria, when they did that, reduced the banks, their numbers, they've now created, merged a lot of their banks, and now they have smaller number of banks from 80, uh, 80 plus, now they have only about 20 something. And we are told they, they actually put a code for corporate governance. It was issued by the bank. A CEO of a bank, for example, was not to serve more than, or as it is now, cannot serve more than a maximum of 10 years. A CEO cannot do that. And corporate practices are being ensured. Now, Paul, you started from a perspective of, a perspective that Emmanuel Lacron actually waded in and supported. Look into the bank itself. You were cautious about using the word coalition. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 but I still insist that the governor and his, his people must come out at this stage and apologize for what had happened. I thought that would be the preamble to his statement because there has been something has occurred. You have been derelict in your duty. Let me point mm. that out quite clearly. Section four so of the law. Who just joined us? Thank you yeah. very much for joining us, Ifia. Okay. Right, Ifia is news editor at Adumo FM. Hi, and Ifia. host. Good yeah. Mm. Mm. Section four of the law says the Bank of Ghana may, for the purpose of verifying. Now, the law uses the word verifying. The particulars submitted under Section 2, which is to collect a license. You want a license, you submit particulars. This is what the law says the Bank of Ghana should do. A, interview a promoter, a proposed director or key management personnel in the course of the verification and inspect the books, records, and premises intended for the use by the bank or specialized deposit-taking institution. It says further that the Bank of Ghana may require that information supplied to the bank be verified certified or otherwise authenticated in the manner that the bank may prescribe. Verified, certified, authenticated in the manner that the bank may prescribe. It was Dr. Addison who granted construction banks license. Did he do these things? If he didn't do these things, that should be the preamble of his press conference to apologize to the people of Ghana. Having been given a responsibility upon an elevated Act 930, you are supposed to verify, certify, authenticate and then you come and tell us that they collected license by false pretenses. Am I the one who was supposed to check the false pretenses? The law says you should check it. The law empowers you to do that. Verify, certify, authenticate. You didn't do it. And then you took pictures with them when they were inaugurating construction bank and brought the whole government machinery there. Dr. Addison, he was the one. But the law's requirement was also that you, the one making the application, ought to be faithful and candid. I'll come to that. There again. The reliction of duty, I'll come to that. That's section 16. You feel it right on the head. Where the Bank of Ghana wants to, let me, let me show you section 9, the prerequisites for a license, just that one. It says that the feasibility report submitted by the applicant under section 7 is based on the Bank of Ghana will ensure that it's based on sound analysis and are reasonable assumptions that the proposed directors and key management personnel of the applicant are fit and proper persons. The Bank of Ghana is supposed to ensure that. Three, that's C. The significant shareholders are suitable and the ownership structure of the proposed bank or specialized deposit taking uh, institution will not hinder effective supervision, including supervision on a consolidated basis. 
that the paid up capital of the applicant is adequate hmm. and the original source of the capital are acceptable and does not include borrowed funds. Dr. Addison is supposed to ensure this. And he comes to a press conference and says that they came, they got the license by false pretenses. And some are using And you don't funds. apologize for it. And he said they were using borrowed funds. And he doesn't apologize for it. And he doesn't admit that there's been dereliction of duty on the part of the institution of the Bank of Ghana. And we are praising him. What are we praising him for? Non-expression non is not admit, uh, non-admitted, well, right? Well, the, the focus he of the press admit. conference. He, he has, he no, has, the he focus has not of the press anything conference anything on that. Was, well, the focus of his press conference mm. should have been to tell us that the job that was given to the institution, we are sorry, we have not been able to do it the way we should have. Henceforth, this is the, the, these are the mechanisms we have put in place to ensure that these things don't happen. You don't come and finger point to other people and we clap for you. What is, what is happening in Ghana? This is the law that Parliament passed. He doesn't verify, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't check the source of the funds, and he comes and says that somebody came uh, 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 false pretenses. He did let's, say, let's go he to Section 16 say, where he has the power to do what did he did. Say, in he did say that the bank, mm -hmm. the bank, Will continue in its supervisory. They have uh, failed. Job to they have failed. He says that, that, that's a wrong statement. He says that I didn't they, even they know he said that. They strengthen the capacity and resources of our supervision department to undertake a comprehensive review and improvement of all supervisory processes and ensure strong enforcement of prudential and conduct regulatory requirement, strengthen overall financial stability risk assessment, and establish adequate measures to promote stability of the financial uh, system. He says quite a lot Dr. about Anderson this. Dr. can only say these and, and, things. He and, can only say these things if and, he was not the one. Are you saying, my question then mm. is, are you saying that if these were not detected from the, from the start and they are detected later on, they should not take action? Yes. That's, if we put it so brilliantly, he's able to say these matters if he was not the one. Because, you see, we have to distinguish between the institution of the Bank of Ghana and the personalities who run it periodically. It's not be the same person running it periodically. So Dr. Addison is able to say these things if he was not the one who granted some of the licenses. But in the case of construction, it was him. So what is he strengthening? I mean, what is he talking about? He can talk about Unibank and their licenses, but in the case of construction, but it was him, Dr. Addison. Unibank who, has no problem with licenses. Well, who granted yeah. the provisional license? Who also granted the, 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 the substantial license? And comes back and says you are going to straight. It was you. If you can say that, well, we are sorry about this, with the Bank of Ghana was not properly regulated or some divisions were not working, since we took over, we have put that in place and these things will not happen. But it was you. If, so so, you start if saying with that, sorry should be sufficient, then the, the, other managers, the other managers indicted should also not, be saying sorry and then just, we move on. Not just sorry. You see, because Dr. Addison's responsibility is given by the people of Ghana. Unibank's responsibility is not given by the people of Ghana. They set up a bank. So they go to an institution that has taken the social contract under hops to establish that kind of regulatory thing for us, the people of Ghana. So I don't worry about the errors of Unibank. When Unibank. you point at me and, and you say under hops, you are speaking to the people, uh, not me, okay. please. <laughs> and, 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 uh, well, hops is a... As a philosopher, and he wrote the social contract many years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's what basically governments operate on, that the people of Ghana give their power to a certain group of people to exercise it on our behalf prudently, okay. according to the laws of parliament. That's right. really the point. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about Unibank. And that's what your consultant was. Akron was saying that 10% of the matter is Unibank. 90% is the Bank of Ghana. Really? So forget about That's what he said. Forget about Bank of Ghana. Let's talk, forget about Construction Bank. Let's talk about, forget about Unibank. Let's talk about Construction Bank. And the role of Dr. Addison vis-a-vis -vis Act 930. What did he do? Act 930 has given you the power to verify and authenticate. You don't do it. You derelict on your duty and you come and hold a press conference and want to ride a high horse? It's only verify and authenticate. There were three, three, it's, three it's different... Let me come to section 16, which actually right. gives Dr. Addison the power to do what he did in terms of revocation of licenses. In Act, Act 930, it says that the bank may revoke a license under section 12, whereby the Bank of Ghana is satisfied that an applicant provided false, misleading, inaccurate information in connection with the application for a license or suppressed material information that the Bank of Ghana is able to do blah 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 blah. Okay, it says that. So you see that the law actually I'm, anticipated. I'm, yes, the law that anticipated. People may not be candid. And the way in which the law says you do it. And false information. Absolutely. And that subsequently you could find them out. And, and when you find them. that the law prescribes how you should do it, I'm coming to it. There again, he faulted how? because I've checked. Okay, he's supposed to give them 30 days notice. <laughs> this is the law. He's supposed to write to them that I want to revoke your license and give them 30 days notice. Did he do that? You know that this has not happened. Oh, I have checked. It didn't happen. As far as Unibank was concerned, it didn't happen. Okay, let's, let's read it. Under the law, there's no Section. emergency situation oh, where this does not apply. Let's read something. Let's read it. Okay, go ahead. 930, 
where the bank proposes to revoke the license of a bank or specialized deposit-taking institution under Section 1, the bank shall give notice in writing to the bank or specialized deposit institution, specify the proposed action and the grounds on which the action is proposed to be taken, give the bank or specialized deposit-taking institution an opportunity to make a written statement within 30 days, 3-0. Did he do that? There's a publication what? in the graphic of if, yesterday if or he did so it, it should have about been, the revocations. If he did it, it should have formed part of his press conference in terms of telling us the procedure because he doesn't act on his own law. He acts on the laws of the people of Ghana as given by parliament. So this is the part of the law that allows you to do what you can do. So this should have also formed the preamble of his press conference. Is Don't they have lawyers at the Bank of Ghana? Suggesting, and you are clearly aware how these things can happen. Is he a suggestion that if these parties went to court, on the basis of non-compliance with the act, seeking the review, you know, powers of the court, they would throw out what they have done. I don't know. I'm not. I can't see. You that. have pointed out a clear violation. I am violation. just saying what Parliament said. Dr. Addison should do. What I can say is that Dr. Addison, when he came to give his press conference, should have stated the base of the press conference and say that what I'm about to do. Allow, it's allowed in section 16 of Act 930. That's what he should have said. Now, the section 16 of Act 930 says, write to them. Let them respond in... He should have said that we wrote to them on August or so-and-so, 30 days has elapsed, and so here I am to announce the revocation of the license. We are not satisfied. He didn't... That's a gross violation of the law and almost a violation of the rights of the persons whose license he has revoked and who are now probably in the case where their names have been bastardized. I mean, I, when I read this, I was totally shocked. I mean, how can... Bank of Ghana... They have so many lawyers, they could have hired you as a lawyer. Even mm -hmm. though you come expensive, I can understand. But, Sorry. But, yeah. Sorry, but Paul. But Paul, this, this, Paul. Is, this is what worrying. Is, what, Are you going to call them to what, respond to why, this? is very why worrying. Why are you fixating sort of mm -hmm. on Dr. Addison? Because we are talking about banks that existed okay. before him. Um, the, the licenses for Beige and all were issued ahead of his coming. I, I understand all that, but I'm, I'm talking about Construction Bank. You see, to the extent that he was there on Construction Bank, he should have averted his mind to it, I think, and also told the press that, you see, my whole issue about this whole matter Did is they that say, when the in police respect come, of construction, but let's not miss this, did they say, yeah. did they say false presentations? No, they said the, bank? Uh, false construction bank and sovereign bank, they, they, they made false representation, false pretenses, that's what he means. But, yeah. but you know that construction bank was already going into winding up. Well, construction so said that sometimes they themselves August. had admitted that. No, but I'm talking about problems. the granting Emmanuel of the Lacron, license. The, this Lacron section is on the granting of the license. Emmanuel Lacron explains that mm. they were going into winding up because they had difficulties raising the minimum capital of four. The winding up has nothing to do with my issue. My okay. issue is the granting of the licenses, which was not done in uh, according to Act 930, number one. Mm. And the revocation was also not done according to Act 930, number two. And these things, Dr. Addison, as a nominal figure of the Bank of Ghana, should have been telling the press when he set out to say, I have revoked license. Under what power have you revoked the licenses? This press conference didn't mention Section 16 of Act. He should have. Mm. He should have been there. That this is the reason why I'm revoking the licenses, and these are the things that have happened. This is Section 16.3. It says how the license should be revoked. 30 days, right to them. Did any of these things happen? You don't just come to a press conference and say, I've revoked licenses. And my concern is, why are we calling him a hero? I mean, if the police come and say, okay, report see, 50. See, hold on, hold on, something. If the police when, come and report when, 100 when they, let's, I need us to clarify these issues. Yeah. And, 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 and Ben, I'll mm. come to you. Mm. I need us to clarify this. You, you speak about 30 days notice violation. I don't speak about it. The law says it. Right, because yeah. you point us to that. Yeah. Do you take the view that the period under which the Unibank, for example, was under administration mm -hmm. could not be considered as a period within which there was potential <laughs> revocation? Because they are stated that they were supposed to be, uh, be under administration mm -hmm. for not mm -hmm. later than 90 days. Yes. Mm -hmm. Within which to consider whether or so, not... So you are saying yes. that we should consider... Uh, the appointment <laughs> of an administrator as a written notice under the law. <laughs> the law says, specify the proposed action. It says, okay. give notice in writing. This, this is the law. Okay. This, that's why I'm worried. It's, it's the fidelity to the law, the bastardization of the law, the ignoring of the law. This is what I'm worried about. What did Ben Epson go to prison for? For the law to be established in Ghana. And what, it says, give notice in writing to the bank. 
It didn't say appoint official administrator. It says specify the proposed action, <laughs> specify it, the proposed action and grounds on which the action is proposed to be taken. Give the bank a special or the specialized deposit institution an opportunity to make a written representation mm. within 30 days of the service of the notice. This was not complied the, with. The construction bank, was it set up, was it licensed since 2017? The facts of the matter. No, was it licensed in the facts of the matter of construction bank? No, I need is to be clear Dr. about that. No, I'm telling you. Let's that clear first, that. The facts was of it? the matter is that Dr. Addison was the one who presided over the provisional and over the substantial. Facts of the matter. Okay. You can check. Now, I mean, now, if he didn't, he should tell us. Okay, now this, this is what I'm mm. going so to do. So I, I think This is what I'm going to do. Just you don't want on. me to end. Just, you will. Mm. You will. Mm. Um, on this point, you on, have on the law, on the law. On this point, on the law. Okay, mm -hmm. finish. Then we take a break. We come back. Then I hear from Ben Evans and Efia. But on, so, so on this round, before he continues, mm -hmm. yes, I disagree with you, Samson, on his position of Addison. I'm asking questions. Yes, I know. But Dr. Addison question. is the governor. Okay. He takes the debit and credit of the institution. He takes the debit and credit of the institution. Mm -hmm. Two, I have, I have a position on persons whose houses are demolished because they are waterways. I've always felt that the person who gave the license for the permission for the house to be built should also be prosecuted. Because if I come to you, that something I want permission to build on this piece of land, and you give me the permission, I lose by my house being demolished. But you must not go free. That's why Bank of Ghana must not. That's why I agree with Paul on that matter. You, the one in the respect of the land to build, you also have a responsibility to do your due diligence. So if you didn't do it, it sh we should not go and blame the one who no, allowed due you. due diligence. Work. I suffered my house being demolished. Okay. And you who agreed that, Ben, go and build. You should go free. Hello. I, I can wrap up here, can't I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, two minutes to wrap up. <laughs> Please go ahead. So, yes, yeah, so on the basis of all, everything that Act 930 proposed that the Bank of Ghana should do, there's been dereliction of duty with the Bank of Ghana must apologize and admit upon. And there's also Dr. Addison's uh, own responsibility in relation to one of the banks. And they must come and explain whether in the revocation of licenses they have complied with the law. Because as it is, it looks like they have not complied with the law. We, the people of Ghana, need some confidence. We don't want Dr. Addison to hold another press conference four months later and say two other banks have gone down. Some of the statements that were made, for instance, that banks had overstated their depositors' funds. And the Bank of Ghana was not aware of it. I mean, how should we go on? How should we go on in life in Ghana when the Bank of Ghana, who is a regulator, is not able to find out two, three years later that some people had overstated the depositors' funds? This problem should be squarely laid at the Bank of Ghana. It is only in respect of Unibank that it is KPMG that has assisted the Bank of Ghana to know the true state of but, affairs, but as reported. Yes. But with, with the rest of the banks, it is the Bank of Ghana's work on-site visits to do all of these things and investigations. Even if it's one bank, Unibank has 400,000 customers. So even if it's Unibank and only, it's still a problem. You saw the statement that was put out about that Dan Adel, and by the way, I have to congratulate him. I know him, very good guy. Mm. Uh, he, the statement he put out, I saw it on the Joy page. He said that we have enough deposits. Why should he be telling us that? He's telling us that because people are not sure. Dan is the new manager. The new manager of the Consolidated Bank. Consolidated yes, bank. congratulations mm -hmm. to him. Now, he does. He's, people are not sure. Because Dr. Addison is not able to tell us that these things have happened. We have put X, Y, Z in place. It will not happen again. When the police find reports 100 armed robberies in a showman, they or in banks, or wherever, they come and tell us 100 armed robberies have been reported. This is how the robbers committed a robbery. This is the kind of thing they use. What we will tell the public is that next time, when you are driving here, do this. When you are doing that, do this. To give some confidence, you don't come and report such a humongous problem to the people of Ghana, and you don't tell us how, on what basis, we should have the confidence that these things will not recur, and we should clap for him. That's, that's what shocks me. For saving depositors' funds. For participating in the depositors' funds not being guaranteed by <laughs> granting licenses without making obeisance to Act 930. A governor of the Bank of Ghana, you grant licenses if are, without if making are, obeisance. If they are sending in reports and that they, they are supposed to send to the Bank of Ghana, and those reports do not reflect what is actually on their books. You should know immediately. How are they supposed so to know? So you should tell us that now we have put an automated system in place. Every day a bank reports, immediately we can check. That's what we need to know. And then if you are revoking licenses, you have to consider the rights of people. The parliament in its wisdom in section 16 put there, you don't just revoke it. If the law says you should write to them, you should write to them. You cannot violate the law in this circumstance. How many years have we come from Fourth Republic? Okay, just just hold on briefly. Just hold on briefly. The managers of the central bank have been listening to us. And we are joined on the line by Elsie Awaji. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Now, 
uh, Paul and even uh, Mr. Emmanuel Lacron, who is a financial analyst whom you may be very familiar with, um, are very clear. Together with others, we have heard from Sidney Kesley Hayford, we have heard from other people who suggest that clearly the Bank of Ghana ought to be telling us exactly how these infractions happened under their watch. What do you um, say? Good, good morning, something. Good morning. Um, I'd like to say good morning to your panelists as well as your listeners. So I, I, have, I have intervened in this program not to um, join the general discussion, but I felt it was imperative for me to join to clarify a couple of um, issues that have come up in the last few um, interventions. We are grateful um, you do. Sure. Uh, number one. It is absolutely important that as we um, speak on these matters, we ensure that we are actually helping um, to educate the public uh, with correct facts and law. And we should not be doing this in a way that confuses the public. Um, your panelist, Paul, referred to several sections of some sections of Act 930. And um, in the process, created impression that the Bank of Ghana uh, may have done something unlawful, and I, I think that's rather unfortunate. The Bank of Ghana wouldn't do anything un unlawful. The Bank of Ghana wouldn't take these extreme measures, which are very difficult to take, without having regard to what the law requires of us. Okay, so you, now, as, as, as second deputy uh, governor, you will clearly know. So can you answer him directly? Yes. Yeah, Did you follow the law in Please providing 30 days that. notice before uh, revocation? Allow me to do that, something. So okay. um, the, if you look at the press conferences we issued, we said that three of the banks, um, four of the banks were deeply insolvent. And we went ahead to list um, what our basis <coughs> for that assertion was. Now, if you look at, at 9.30, we absolutely have the legal power to revoke a license instantly under Section 123 of the Act. Mm. There is no notice requirement. When a bank has reached a trigger point of insolvency, you immediately, it's actually too late in the day. But the law, having found that out, you immediately revoke the license. You are not under 123. And we say that in the press conference. And we did what was required by us, by the law. Section 16 comes in to say that when you have found uh, under false pretenses that a, a bank um, uh, obtained its license, you can go ahead and revoke their license under Section 16. And then you go back to 123 to say, which also says that once that license has been revoked, you appoint a receiver. 160, one, uh, Section 16 has a due process requirement. You call, you, you write a notice to them, and et cetera. Now, the Bank of Ghana has on several locations. The top management of the Bank of Ghana has sat with the chairman, the, the chairman, the board, the shareholders of the, of the bank and explain to them what our findings are, giving them opportunity to correct the findings that we put before them. Each of those meetings were memorialized, were documented, and sent back to these institutions. So there, there's written records of these engagements. Nevertheless, Section 16, and I'm, I'm very surprised that your panelists did not uh, pay attention to that. Section 16 gives us the power to say, when at some point you find that it is absolutely necessary to revoke that license based on, you know, what um, grounds have been established, including uh, having obtained the license by false pretenses, you are entitled to revoke that license if you feel, you feel that it is an emergency situation and the safety of, of the financial system is at stake, the safety of deposit is at stake. Mm. We are within our power to revoke that license. You know, don't, never mind that we've even given them ample opportunity to do that. At which point I would say, well, you know, we have put you on, on notice. But at this point, we have power to act an emergency. It would be extremely irresponsible of the law to say that a financial regulator is always required to give 30-day notice. Because if you know anything about financial stability, you know that that can go down in a, in a split second. Mm. So every responsible law that's well designed is going to give you that, that power to do that. Okay. For as long as you have sufficient ground to do it. All right. And so we, it is very unfortunate that someone sits there to create the impression that we did not know what we're doing. Mm. And I think that should be dispelled immediately. 
Uh, but but you, you, will agree, you will agree that you will agree that Paul is asking legitimate questions because but if, of course, if, but if but you are found you in your statement to not to have addressed an, an issue and, and, tell, and, and he raises well, them, that is legitimate. And, people, and it, 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 it assists you also to further assist the public to completely appreciate what is going on. Well, let's do it well. All right. Let's do that okay. well. That's all I'm saying. Right. The can second I, can point I? about uh, yeah. Doctor, again, I'm not on this panel, so R please allow me to intervene, and you can ask questions, and then I'll be off. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm due for another appointment. Um, <laughs> okay, the, okay, go the ahead. The issue about Dr. Addison having issued a license to uh, construction, that's also a bit erroneous. Um, the process of due diligence on the banking license application is done prior to the issuance of a provisional license. The provisional license in the case of the three banks, Sovereign, um, Beige, and uh, Construction, were issued in 2016, long before Dr. Addison was appointed. Okay? You, you gave the institution a provisional license saying, we have done our due diligence, we have checked your records and everything you brought before us, and we're satisfied that you can operate as a bank. We give you a provisional license. We tell you to go, and it is, the provisional license is subject perhaps to ABC conditions you must meet before a final license is issued to you. Okay. Normally for six months. At the end of that period, the Bank of Ghana tells you, well, given the fact that you have um, met XYZ conditions, which we, we, we imposed on you under the, the provisional license, at this point you have met those requirements, and therefore here's your license. Okay, so that's really what happened. So the due diligence would have been made at the time of the issuance or prior to the issuance of the, of the, uh, the provisional, provisional license. license. And then you're given the right to start on a provisional basis subject to meeting specified conditions. So that process was, took place in 2016. Yes, you, you, you talk about how he went to launch it and etc. Well, yeah, I mean, that was last year. He went to launch it. But the license, the, you know, the important part of the licensing process had taken part prior to his, his taking uh, office. So, again, that's an unnecessary confusion, and it really doesn't, um, it, it doesn't help the discussion going forward. The Bank of okay, Canada so, has so, been so, so, so it is factual that the governor now supervised or that the final license was issued under his watch, correct? But I have just explained to you that the final license is issued, it's almost predicated upon the fact that we have given you, if we do not like your application, you don't even get a provisional license. But we give you a provisional license subject to you meeting specified conditions. Once you have met those specified conditions, unless another due diligence has taken place to show that um, your original documents were not good, it is normally a matter of course at that point. That it doesn't stop there. The law says that within six months after you have obtained, your, you have been launched and started operations uh, on a final basis, the Bank of Ghana should come in and do another audit and make sure that everything you said was in place. Okay. So Dr. Addison then started that process of saying, well, you know, you got your final license on this day uh, because you had met the specified conditions that were imposed under your, okay, uh, if, if, I, if I may ask and get very quick responses, brief, so that so you can I, also I'm, I'm go I'm away. I'm done with my point. Okay. Dr. Addison then sent the team in there to go and check to make sure that they are in, uh, within the law, after six months of starting operations, they are really doing what we want them to do. And in fact, that their license was done properly. And then that's how we found all of these things. So it is very important to put things in context. And we have said, we are not trying to shield anybody, we have said that part of this whole trend that emerged of fake capital, of poor governance, poor risk management in the bank, uh, insider dealings and all of that, was because supervision was weak. We have said that ample time. Dr. Addison himself has said that at press conferences and all of that. And we are saying that we are instituting several measures to make sure that we never, ever get back to those days. But, but is it and not we, curious, though? I, but, sorry, but I appreciate your explanation, but I want to carry my audience, everybody, along with you. Is it not yeah. curious, though, that you do not have only one bank that receives their you know, final certification uh, from the current governor? Actually, it, uh, for Beige, was issued uh, in June 2017, correct? 
Yeah. The final, like, again, yes. I, I really need to explain the yes. point. Yes, yes. So, yeah. So, two, so, Dr. Addison comes in in April. He takes office effectively in, in April. Um, and then there's already two provisional licenses that have been issued, subject to conditions, right? Conditions are met. Uh, banking supervision department advises that these conditions have been met. Everything is fine. You know, license is issued. Now, in, in two months, he will not have conducted due diligence. When you assume office as governor, in two months... What you are you, saying... You're told What you're that, saying, what you're saying yeah. is that... What you're saying is that... For example, as related to Beige, which received its license in June 2017, uh, Construction Bank, all of these, um, he, no. he, he supervised, sort of. You are saying he that... He did not supervise. Okay, I mean, it happened need, under his really watch. Let me use those right expressions. It, it happened under his watch. You're saying that for all of these, at that material moment, as, as of June 2017, these claims of false um, whatever were not known. They have only become known to the bank later, after the final certificates were issued? The bank, the bank has been under new management. I mean, the governor, I would let me be more specific, was appointed in April last year, okay? When you assume office as governor, you're not going to get into the operational details of a department, day one, okay? You have before you in June like uh, provisional licenses that were issued a year before, mm. and you mm. have to make you mm. you know you have a recommendation to say well they were asked to meet these additional requirements they have met them, and you on the strength of the recommendation of the director of the department who is under oath to do the right thing, mm. you know the final license is issued the due diligence is done before then mm. uh, from the date. Uh, before before the provisional license is even issued, from the date of the issuance of the provisional license, you are monitoring your your um, banking provision department is monitoring to ensure that they meet those additional conditions you placed on them. Okay, and this you is get, you get a recommendation within two months or a, a month and a half of an okay. office to say. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry. Money. I'm very sorry, but uh, assist me to do this. Paragraph yeah. seven of your statement said that yeah. Beige Bank and Construction Bank were each granted provisional licenses in 2016 yeah. and launched in 2017. That would be yeah. after they had received their uh, final certificate. Yeah. Now, subsequent investigations conducted by the Bank of Ghana revealed that, similar to the case of Sovereign Bank, both banks obtained their banking licenses under false pretenses through the use of suspicious and non-existent capital which has resulted in a situation where their reported capital in, is inaccessible to them for their operation. So you're saying that all of these matters could not have been um, detected before... Oh, okay, something. Let me try one more time to explain this. <laughs> the the, these capital verifications would have been done before the provisional license of the case. Correct. Okay? At some point, they get a provisional license. You say, okay, we've checked your capital. Your capital uh, seems to be in place. It's invested. It's showing that it's invested in Bank A or Bank B on behalf of this new bank. Mm -hmm. Okay, that looks fine on the face of it. We've done the verification. It's there. So you say, well, maybe you should also meet one, two, three other uh, conditions for the period that you're operating under a provisional license. And at some point, they're going to give you a final license. So the final license is issued because you've met those additional conditions as well. Then in six months after that, we go in to check to make sure, well, you're operating well according to your business plan, everything seems to be in place. Then we begin to find, as we look deeper, that at some point after you have obtained your, li you have obtained your license, your, even your final license, the money that was meant for the bank of capital has moved. The money was supposed to have been an investment in other places. That could be called back by the bank for its operation. The bank doesn't seem to have access to that capital. It's supposed to be with company X or investment house X. And we're saying, but where is, why are you operating without sufficient capital? Because we license you on the basis that you have a capital. Then we ask these third parties and turns out that shareholders have moved the money out of those investments. 
So, in effect, those were borrowed funds from the beginning, maybe, or some other fictitious means of capital, which have subsequently been moved out by shareholders. Dr. Addison then decides it's time to call these people to book. So you call them in, you help, you make them explain to you what is going on, what is happening to the capital, based on which you were even given a provisional license in the first place. So you have a lot to offer, you know, to, to answer. They go back and forth. They bring this document. They bring that document. You, you meet them umpteen times and then realize that the story doesn't add up. And so you take a decision at some point. So Dr. Okay. Addison then begins to start this process of uncovering what really went on with the licensing of these banks. And then having found uh, enough basis to take action, has taken action. Well, now, well, we are very well, well from, from, from an ordinary mind, without the sophistication that you bring to all of it, um, it, it sounds that it, it's certainly a problem that within the period which should be as a probational period, um, you, you are unable to do what the law requires you to verify and authenticate certain things. And all of these, you know, they slip through. And then only after that, then we are, we are taking them on, even though the law makes provision that, as I, I suggested to Paul, if they are not candid and if they are not frank from the start, then you could be taking on. I would want you, if you, if you don't mind, to just quickly, briefly um, s tell us whether you have a grand plan going forward or you are actually acting ad hoc in these circumstances. I refer to the Nigerian example of the Alpha Project, Alpha Initiative. I don't know if this is what the Bank of Ghana is up to, using the minimum capital threshold to you know, force mergers as happening in Nigeria and so on and so forth, so that the system is sanitized. Is there a blueprint? There is indeed a blueprint. And let me go back before I talk about the blueprint. Let me go back to something one of your, your, your panelists have said um, earlier on. You've got to distinguish the institution from the leadership. Now, we have been very clear that there were lapses in supervision, and that is an important part of the story. We have not shielded that part of the story. Now, since Dr. Addison came, a lot of changes have been made. No, but the banks, the, banks, the, banks, the banks that have been faulted in this circumstance, the five banks, we are not only dealing with them as institutions, but we are dealing with the, the shareholders, the management as well. So it is, it is fair for people to make the suggestion that you don't only deal with the Bank of Ghana as the institution, but the human faces that make that institution as well. Well, but, well if you would listen to me, Thompson. So changes will have been made. I mean, the, the head of the relevant department, for example, were moved for, for better, for more accountability, okay? Um, there are new, I don't want to go into detail, but there's a lot of changes that have taken place, that have taken place. Precisely because we recognize that things, there were lapses in the past, mm. and we need to strengthen even the face of the bank. So we have made a lot of changes in that regard. Uh, and we take, we, I mean, it's still the institution that we all work for. So in the end, we're responsible for the failings of that institution, whether or not we were there at the time or not. Okay. But we're saying that we, the new leadership, has decided to take action. So it's amazing nobody's talking about that. You know, since last year, we have, since uh, August last year, there's been co consistent action towards enforcement of the law. Right. Enforcement and doing what the law requires us to do. And we have not reneged on that. Mm. Why it wasn't done before, that's an entirely different story. But let's have confidence in the fact that going forward, we're committed to enforcing the law. Right. And not just that. Okay. We're enforcing to provide it, and I'm going to get into the blueprint matter now. Yeah. We, we have cast a new vision for the banking sector. And in our engagement with the sector, we have been very clear about the fact that we're all going to do what is right. You, you guys and us. Now, we have set in place a slew of new uh, regulations and uh, direct, uh, directives. Banks, for example, you talked about the minimum capital increase. That's one way of ensuring that we have really well-capitalized banks doing business and taking care of people's money. Number two is the fact that we're moving into what we call the Basel 2 and 3 capital framework, which is a more robust and more transparent way of arriving at the bank's capital. So we're doing that as well. The implementation has started. Uh, we're also saying that the way in which you account for your bad loans, including loans that have been taken by shareholders and directors and managers, 
who have no intentions of paying, the way you calculate that has changed. We're going international, IFRS 9. It's a more transparent system. We all know very early on whether those loans are going to be paid back or not and how that would impact your capital. Okay. So the public would know. All so right. we're doing that. All right. We introduced a corporate governance directive, very clearly spelling out our expectations of the board of these institutions and, and of senior managers and all of that. Right. We, it, it does appear you have a lot more work to do program. because if uh, significant significant stakeholders like Emmanuel Macron is unaware of the blueprint, then that's not good enough. You would have a lot of work to do there. But, but he, he made a suggestion about some of the banks that you don't exactly say are insolvent um, and therefore could have benefited from the bailout that you have used to set up the construction, uh, the consolidated bank. What do you say about that view? Which banks are we talking about? Well, as far as he's concerned, uh, banks like uh, Construction Bank, uh, banks like, is it the, the Royal Bank? Oh, that's untrue. I mean, the Royal Bank is very, is, you know, its capital adequacy ratio is negative 80% or something like that, when the law requires it to have a positive number of 10. So these banks were insolvent. Construction was not insolvent, but was operating at one third of the minimum capital of 120 million. One third. The law says that you need a minimum of 120 million to operate okay. at the bank. At the point of license, and that was what was required mm. because of the of of the of the of the, um, of the circumstances surrounding how its capital was procured. In effect, it was operating with only 40 million Ghana cedis. That's one third of the minimum capital, and it could not be allowed to continue. We had given them even that ample time to make it up, and that wasn't working. And it, they held customer deposits. Okay. They were part of the clearing system. All right. They were part of the entire financial system okay. with exposures uh, that other banks faced. Okay. So we needed to take that action. So it's not true that we wouldn't take these actions lightly. I, I have to I have to stress that point. These are uh, things that cost us sleepless nights for months, for mm. weeks. You okay. know, it, these are very weighty things. Okay. So let's Thank you. Just take that. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, LC, f um, Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana. Unfortunate, though, that you are so busy, you can't take a couple of questions from uh, my colleagues in the studio. That would have been very nice. But thank you very much for your intervention. Okay, so, um, Paul, yes. in two minutes, mm -hmm. let, you let you were disagreeing as she she yes, she I, I she she, she, she sought to she to sought say. to point you out to a, a number of things. Yes. I have suggested to you that there could be an emergency provision yeah, that, that does not require them to, I have seen that. So to, to give a 30-day no notice. Okay, fair enough. Let me start uh, mm. on a nice note. I think that the second part of your interview with her was good. She is giving us in some hope that something is happening and that, that's, that's important. I, th I also think that everything she said about the law is not correct, and I'm going to point that out. So she identifies, in addition to Section 16, Section 123, which gives the Bank of Ghana the power to revoke licenses. Now she says that under section 123 where the bank is insolvent, they can immediately revoke the licenses without complying with the 30 days regulation that 16 prescribes. Um, and then under 16 they have to do that. Okay, so let me come to the point. There were five banks whose licenses they revoked and they gave reasons for revocation of these licenses. So some were insolvent, they talked about Unibank, etc. That will fall under 123. I'll come to 123. Those that they said did not um, made false pretenses. It's squarely false under 16. It is under 16 when you want to revoke under false pretense. It is 16. It says here, 16.1, the Bank of Ghana may revoke license issued under Section 12 where the Bank of Ghana is satisfied that an applicant provided false, misleading, or inaccurate information. Now, this is what Dr. Addison said about Construction Bank. In that regard, you have to comply with the 30 days of Section 16. There's no other way. You have to comply. Okay. So in the case of Construction Bank and Sovereign Bank, they had violated 16 if they didn't send a 30-day notice. Okay. Now, in the case of the 123 that she cites, where under insolvency you are able to revoke the licenses, Section 7, which is the last one of 123, says that the Bank of Ghana shall notify mm. these institutions. It doesn't say 30 days. It okay. says notify. Did they notify Unibank that they were going to revoke? They didn't. Okay, thank so you. they violated okay. both 123 and 16. Okay. And I think she has to get it clear. Thank I you. mean, officials must get these matters thank clear. You. Thank you. She got right. it wrong. The law right. is right. Right. So, um, Evans. As she spoke, I heard you also shaking your head and, 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 and suggesting to me that there's some bit of inaccuracies at some point. 
I mean, I, I thought, <coughs> honestly, that, and, and, and still think, that until we shift the blame onto the Bank of Ghana, we are not going to solve the problem to the banking sector. Really? That's my position. Um, because as we all know, as human beings as we are, we are fallible. If you leave us to our, to our own powers, we would violate the law. That is why we have the police service, to check us <laughs> at the traffic light. If you leave me and I'm busy and I'm rushing here to come and be on the show, the news file, I'll run the red light. That is why the policeman must be there to check me. And in countries where they know that you'll be caught, when you get to the red light, no matter how busy you are, you'll stop. If you don't want to run the red light, you leave home early because you know you'll be caught. Because the individuals responsible for the collapse of these banks know they will not be caught, they do what they do. And until we shift the blame onto the Bank of Ghana, we will not fix the problem. And that is why I was shaking my head. I was shaking my head because I, I heard the deputy governor make the point, almost to say that between the six months when the provisional license is issued and the substantive license, the Bank of Ghana has no other responsibility other than simply looking at they have the infrastructure and looking at the faces. And because the provisional license uh, requirements have been met, it's almost as if it's automatic that you know, the uh, substantive license will be granted. And then post the substantive license, then you go into looking at their, whether they, they, the documents they had provided for the provisional license were, was, were done legally and without uh, you know, false pretenses. To, so to so you appreciate terms. her explanations, but they do not negate your concerns. No, I have concerns. <laughs> so because I think that whoever framed that law and gave a provisional license and then a substantive license thought that within the six months, you do proper due diligence mm. to be sure that the basis for which you granted a provisional license is sound before you go ahead and grant the substantive license. Paul read the law, verify, authenticate. I mean, and exactly. the, last, the other way, there are three actually certified. certified. You know, so, mm. so for me, that is where my problem is. I mean, having said that, though, uh, and he says that we need to separate the institution from the individual. I agree. And so we, we, we still need to make the point, taking our own point on separating the institution from the individual. The institution of the Bank of Ghana failed the depositors fundamentally, filled this country. Because remember that the 5.67 billion we've taken to build them out, we will pay. No, the question is of corporate governance, making sure that the persons who are going to run the bank that you issue the license to are fit and proper. Fit and proper. Yeah. How are they supposed to be, be so, so assured yeah. that they will not do anything wrong? Can no. you imagine that? No, I, I, I get the point. That they come no, with no, all, no matter their, how, all their certificates. No matter how stringent and their your achievements checks are, yeah. people might beat the system. That I understand. That I understand. But not when you've told me that the guys were borrowing money to show you when the money was actually not there, something that you had six months to verify. So I'm assuming that the time that he presented these documents to get a provisional license, I'm talking about the Bank of Ghana as an institution, mm. not Mr. Addison. At the time that he presented these documents to get a provisional license, they had, the documents that you now determined six or one year down the line that were, were fraudulent, um, to borrow the term if, it's, if, it's, if we can use that in this term, were there. And that even if you couldn't determine it at the time you gave the provisional license, you have six months to double check and see if that you could, you could find that. She says reasons some persons within the supervisory uh, departments have been either removed or something. No, but, but, but yeah, but it's an institution. You see, I'm going back to her own words. Right. Separate the institution from the individuals. So whether you sack the people or not, it is the institution you want to hold to account. And you, you quoted something that Ms. Addison said about going forward what they want to do. Right. And one of the things he says is reviewing guidelines, directives, and regulations to the industry. And I'm thinking the first review that must be done is at the Bank of Ghana itself. I mean, that's where we need to start this conversation. He also says, strictly enforce fit and proper guidelines. And I'm, I'm like, the fit and proper guidelines must first apply to the, the guys at the Bank of Ghana right now. Elsie just informed you that they have a number of things they have issued, including corporate governance issues and all of that. Yes. It's just that people are but passing you fix, them. But you fix the fundamental problem, in my view, which is a problem at the central bank, 
and then you move forward. And, and I, I agree with Paul when he says that when he, she, he did the press conference, from an institutional point of view, yes, I was disappointed. But you need to first own that we had made some errors. The Bank of Ghana had made some Let me tell you why. And I'm, my, my position really is from what I heard on Ghana Connect yesterday. We brought in a gentleman who is a victim of the Capital Bank, UT Bank uh, collapse. Right. Who says, a year on, he hasn't been paid his, his severance package. Right. He hasn't found a job. And he represents the entire group. Mm. Two of his colleagues have passed on. They are dead. Because of the stress attached to not having a job, having a family, and not being able to sort of cater for them. And that in the last week, more of their colleagues who were working for the GCB had been sacked. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, and he says, in the department in which he worked at Capital Bank, they were filing their reports to the central bank every month. And he says that if the Bank of Ghana at that time were mindful to check what they were filing, they would have noticed the problem okay. and fixed it before it got to where it got to. right? And then there's a second um, customer of the current bid, bid bank, which has now gone under. Who I asked directly, who do you blame for this? He says a central bank, right? And these are, for me, the real faces of the crisis. Forget about the owners and directors and all that. We've seen the owners and directors of the two banks that collapsed last year. They're walking free, right? It's, it's about the individuals who have deposits in the bank. The woman like the woman you represented, who was assaulted by the police officer, those are the people, for me, when I, I think about what has happened in the banking sector, I have their faces in print in my, on my mind. And it's, it's because of these individuals that I believe we need to get the Bank of Ghana to be up and doing. Yes, I think the reason why, and, and that's why I digress with Paul, people are applauding, that when you make an error, it's better, to, it's better late than never. Right. I think they have come to the realization that things have gone on in the past that simply isn't on. So we are making amends. So it's good to make amends. But it's good in making amends to own that we made a mistake. It's when you own that you make a mistake that you can find the appropriate solutions to deal with it. Final point on this is that there's a book I'm pretty sure that has been going around and people have been, have been talking about it. But I checked to see if it is really a book. And I find that it really is a book, which is that the best way to rob a bank is to own one. It's a title. <laughs> of, of a book written by William Black. It's a fascinating piece because it's, it actually looks into a similar case that happened in the US in the 80s. And William was examining why it happened. And he comes up with this theory called uh, control fraud, which essentially is that uh, looting a company for personal profit. In essence, the CEOs, etc., formed the company, looted it for their personal profit. And he makes the point that I think we need to pay attention to. He says the reason why it happened in the US is because the regulators were not active, proactive, and independent. And there was political interference. And my question is, is the central bank truly independent? Is there, because I'm asking my question, how come these licenses were issued in the past? Is it that the person who came to apply had big political links and therefore, people ignored the obvious, which is really what William found in the analysis they did in the US, that because there was that, the central, the regulators ignored the obvious and went ahead and issued licenses and closed their eyes to the continuing uh, violation of the law. In fact, he makes another point, that control fraud is an active and continuing activity in every financial sector, which means Currently, as we speak of these five banks and the two that collapsed last year, there are possibly more banks currently in existence in Ghana right now doing the same things. My question is, is the Bank of Ghana aware? If they are, are they taking preemptive measures so that we don't get to the point where a year down the line, we are talking about two three more banks. Okay, so you know what? Evan's very interesting, fascinating points you are making. We will go for a break. When we return, uh, we'll hear from um, Mr. Ben Emson, we'll hear from Afia, but don't terminate your point. You will have to develop that point further. And the point where you make about your major concern being the taxpayer having to fund, to fund what appears to be 
you know, something that has been done deliberately to enrich other people. And we should also answer the question. Before 2016, the Bank of Ghana did it have teeth to bite because the law they are using presently was done in 2016. You are still here on News File, a special edition in this August with editors, hosts, and analysts. We'll be right back to hear very fascinating views from Ben Efson, Efia Pokua, and also uh, Evans will continue his point. Welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis show. And uh, I've got Ben Epstein, I've got Fia Pokwa, I've got um, Paul Admochery. You heard him quite extensively. And Evans Mensah uh, has a point that he will continue to develop. And yet another leg of the point, he feels that the taxpayer should not be burdened with the inefficiencies and the sort of, quote unquote, the fraud of... Um, officials and private individuals. Now, uh, Ben, I don't know where you take it from, but the TUC has issued a statement. Doctor, uh, it's, a, it's a secretary general, right? Issue, it's issued a statement and they applaud the Bank of Ghana like many people have done, including the financial experts, um, except that as people applaud or the experts applaud, they also have questions to ask, like you guys are doing this morning. But the TUC, applaud them and seem to suggest that they have trust that the assurance of depositors funds not being affected is sacred and number two the assurance of there will not be job losses is also you know uh, cast in stone do you feel that you see probably is not it's not properly appreciating the situation, particularly in respect of job losses. The guy say, "Kejo, kejo baso jelebi." You will know how a person will. Yeah, yes, you know how a person will dance by the way he sit in the chair and starts dancing. Mm. If UT and capital banks, people have lost their jobs, like Ivan said. Yeah. Two banks. A total of about 800 so far, right? Yes, yes. And even those that are still being held by the GCB because they, took the, they did the purchase and acquisition. They have been on uh, probation, probation, and their probation is being renewed yeah. after a probation. Yeah. So if they two are not banks, assured. nearly 1,000, hmm. five banks, if 3,000 lose their job, it will not be out of place. I believe that, you know, in assuring uh, depositors of their monies, hmm. we need to also look at job losses. Now, there are five banks that are now consolidated. So if we did an a, a radius of about half a mile, there is Unibank, there is Beige Capital, yeah. and then there is, let's say, uh, Sovereign. What do we do? I believe Those that... Those are the greater numbers are Unibank to start with, yes. and then Beige. Yes. Mm. So what, what do we do? I believe that, yes, the Bank of Ghana has done well, but the issue of trying to separate who was there before. If, for example, today, the IMF, where else it came from, says that, look, the Bank of Ghana has been fantastic. Let's give the management a million dollars bonus, take and chop. Will else go and bring the previous governor to take it? I, I, I could sense her anger, a bit, and frustration. Or would they put it to benefit the institution? That is it. You know, I think that where she's come from, I can understand the different cultures she's operating in. She's working at IMF, we're now Bank of Ghana, you are doing well. You might be able to take the bullet. Even if you're angry, just swallow, put some water in your mouth and swallow it. You know, I think that it's a good idea. And I believe that they must be a bit more proactive. Like, have a system of maybe every six months, or even every year, publishing what they find out wrong in people's banks. Now, if the banks know that every year there will be a publication open, not that they should go into nitty gritties. And you know that if this year, there's a flag that your ratio is going down. There'll be a mass withdrawal. There'll be a run on the bank. You be careful. Are you with me? If there was period, they give you what, where we've come from. So they will, be, they will be doing that, but privately, not publicly. Ah, but Our that, savings culture is very bad. 
and you don't want to drive away. You see, the that. privately thing is what has come to now. Because from what Elsie was saying, there have been warning signs, warning signs in the past year and a half, two years. Don't forget they are working with law. They yeah, must working work with law. under law. Yes. Now, I'm sure the law will say that if you see something going wrong, that people are throwing stones, you go there, hit your head, I have my privacy. No, 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 no. The law is there, but you must be, there must be a limit as to how you can intrude into a business in terms of... But if the banks know, those that are untied so far, if they know that if there is a flag, the Bank of Ghana is likely to use that. The following banks have been issued, so, so, and so. There will be a run, but you, you will sack yourself. Because there will be a run, but people go and take their money and put it in the banks that they have not been flags raised. Beyond the blame game that we are elevating quite, uh, fo focusing on a lot more, what should be happening? The TUC, uh, Dr. Yaoba, for example, says that um, it is important that the activities that have led to the collapse of these banks and necessitated what is perhaps the biggest bank bailout in Ghana's history must be properly investigated and those culpable punished in accordance with the laws of the land. I think that we need to set examples if they have been proved that, as Elsie said, that there may have been collusion of signs they have seen, people should be punished. I believe that if the government decides that, look, we've given this, we've taken out their licenses, we've given it, then the standards must be set. You know, those that UT Bank, if there is willful, deliberate attempt to use the postage money, there might be some sanctions. Other than that, going forward, there should be something that the public will see that if there's a, a yearly Bank of Ghana gives ratings of banks, A, B, C, if you're not going into their details, if you know that the bank you deposited it is in B, Group B, in terms of efficiency and solvency, and the following year the bank goes to Group C, without the bank saying that your ratio is going down, you go and move your account. Your focus on that. Can we look at this small issue? It may not be small. People are, in respect of what you are mentioning, people are referring to the awards, the yeah. banking awards. That may be what is used to measure who is doing well and who is not doing well. <laughs> but the questions come, is it not the same KPMG that, uh, you know, does whatever to compile whatever happens? So where are they? And um, Emmanuel Lacron asked the question, you know, they are this auditors of these banks, <laughs> did they not see all of these problems that KPMG now goes in and finds in some place? I think that, you know, if you are, you are KPMG or a, uh, an institution that looks into these affairs, some say, will you say you are going on that so you don't get a job? I'm not imputing anything. But there's a possibility that maybe they may not have the information that the banks give to a central bank because it's required by law. But I think that for starters, this Bank of Ghana announces that we will grade banks every year. That in itself will be a check, because if you are struggling, you may decide to opt out, and there must be punities, punitive measures to be announced. Because if you are in Group B and next year in Group C, that you see that they will run on the bank. And these are lessons than The one minimum, I think those things are there. The minimum of depositors' funds you must have the yeah. capital you must have, yeah. should not be more, uh, less than 10%. Yes. So if you don't have that, immediately mm. they will come in and start doing what, you know, ought to put you on notice to do the right things. You see, I would say that if my mother was alive and I was told that, look, your mother is unconscious, we have to amputate the leg for her to be alive. I would say, go ahead. I brought a living mother with one leg than letting... I, I saying that, oh, if my mother wakes up and the leg has been cut, you commit suicide. No. Mm. Well, there may be situations where the amputation might lead to further deterioration and quicker death. But at least I, I would have tried to save their life. Okay, I suspect that's what the Bank of Ghana <laughs> <laughs> is talking about here. Now, um, uh, I, I will read some of your messages that you have been sending in, but uh, let's hear from a fear. Um, as uh, LC was speaking, you, you, you were disagreeing and nodding. I mean, I'm interested in what you were nodding in agreement with. Well, I, uh, in, if, in reference to Paul's um, 
uh, reference to section 16 of the 930. In, in section, subsection 7 of the 16, says that um, despite uh, subsection 3 and 4, the Bank of Ghana may, in cases of emergency, or in the public interest, revoke the license of the bank, uh, of the specialized uh, deposit taking institution without notice. And I think that this is where Elsie was um, coming from. Emphasizing. That in emergency cases, to be fair to her in the Bank of Ghana, I think that in their press conference, they admitted error, they admitted failure of their supervisory. They did. They I, did. Can, I, I didn't they read did. it anyway. She even said it. Uh, she even said it this morning. She okay. said they are not claiming I have read that. and highlighted their statements. I can find that. Then I think that is in reference okay. to what she said. Because I, I heard it very clear this morning. Okay. She said they admit that the supervisory division of, of the BOG did fail in, in, in ensuring that they enforce uh, the rules of super, uh, supervision of these banks. So I think we, we, we need to be fair to her. But despite this um, emergency cases. They did not even indicate in their press conference that this was a matter of emergency, emergency. or requiring emergency. And that's the point that uh, uh, Paul raised. I think that it's also very fair that we don't personalize the issue surrounding this. This is not a Dr. Addison Do issue. Do you see the questions that can be raised? Absolutely. If you, if you seem to claim that in all the situations, it's that of emergency. So you go under one, two, one, two, three. One, two, three mm. of the act. But even the, one, two, three. That, that, that also will be an indictment on the institution it's as well. Absolutely. That's why one, two, three, seven also says that even in emergency cases, as in 16, seven, you issue a notice after your emergency revocation has been done. So, so that is very clear. And that's why Bank of Ghana ought to admit, like they have admitted, their failure in all this, this issue. But... The admission of their failure alone is not enough. They need to come back and say that their supervisory uh, 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 division of the bank has failed, and therefore somebody has to take the flag. Yeah. By now, somebody has to go home. Yeah. Either the whole department is sent home in, on interdiction, upon investigation for better and, and further particulars of evidence on what led to this failure to enforce the law, and what to, to do it to ensure that, because you can't just send uh, punish the, the individual defaulting banks for this. Somebody ought to have supervised. And there's a reason why this uh, amendment of the banking law was implemented. You know that we had a law previously. And so we enacted uh, this new uh, law in 2016. Uh, uh, and it was supposed to cure an evil in the existing law. So it's curing that evil, is it not? It, it is not, because the law is still not being enforced. There's a reason why this bill, when it was before Parliament in 2015, went to vigorous debates, vigorous debates in various um, 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 stages. Stakeholders were engaged because there was an existing problem, starting from the rural banks. Then we came to this microfinance and savings and loans people, then the DKM issue. So if you look at this, is a very detailed law that is curing all evil, even lifting the veil under company law. And that is why the law is saying that, and that in, in this act, where even the general provision in the com company law is that you cannot lift the, the veil, but this act, you will lift the veil. So personal liability can even be enforced to the directors of a company. So we all understand that the, the, the law was not enforced. You refer to DKM, Corporate. and we heard the president squarely admit and put the blame on the supervision, uh, supervision department of the Bank of Ghana for the DKM situation. Um, did you hear the Bank of Ghana give a semblance of admission of they not doing a good job which led to the DKM situation? Well, they didn't. At that time, they didn't. At that time, they didn't. But later, I think that they appreciated, you know, there's this politics, diplomatic politics that is going on, where people are not bold enough to admit. Elsewhere in other countries, somebody would have, on their own, just walked out, resigned for failure of people under him, or failure to give bold leadership in ensuring that those under him or the various departments under him uh, fail to act. But they are there. If and this are, is politics that we know happens in, 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 in this in nation. Something, Ghana, we don't have that sack myself syndrome. We don't. We don't, but we should. We should, and that is why, if we don't have the "assack myself" syndrome, and that is why the law makes it makes provisions for the law is of to sack you back where you point, are head. But to your point, you know about this was a situation of emergency and all of that. I, I suppose that what you had discussed off air, you may want to bring uh, on air. Yeah. You say some of these were clearly Ponzi schemes. Yeah, we have Ponzi schemes. I mean, if you read so the articles, so it can't be an banking. emergency situation then. 
But the Bank of Ghana itself admits. And that's why I think that there's conflict. In, I'm just saying that the law gives provision for revocation of licenses under emergency situations. But the Bank of Ghana itself admits. Elsie has told us this morning that some of these breaches were notified and, and, and they were seen continuously. It's not a one-off thing. So the emergency application under the law does not even come in. But she is also saying that this is a new leadership that took over in April, which is also a fact and we must admit. But I'm saying the Bank of Ghana is Bank of Ghana. We do not care about what leadership or which leadership. But we also have to admit that leadership goes and comes. This new leader, and I, that's why I agree with uh, Paul on the construction bank issue. Because even if you use this period of, he took over in April as an argument, but the construction bank issue, he was there when the license was granted. So what did he do? Beige what bank. due diligence did he well. do? Beige Bank. Well, and we've seen the risky investment they've done, the failure to ensure that risk management is properly done, investing in holding companies elsewhere in very risky and un, un, unknown charters, like in real estate. And they have no business going there. Why and the not? Bank of Ghana Why not? There's money in real estate. There's money in real estate. If but I can do guarantee you have that expertise? my depositors will get their money when they but come, why not? Something like this. You see, there's a problem where directors of a bank, Sometimes, if you look at the formation of the bank, the board of directors, even people do not have the capacity to understand investment. And, and we have to go into this issue about who becomes a board member, checking the directors. Because there's a reason why the company law makes for provisions for directors of a bank or the board of directors checking the director of the bank. Mm. But the board of, direct, uh, the, uh, board, the, the board of directors ought to have the skills and expertise to know when the directors are messing up. And if the board of directors of Beige uh, Capital had the expertise, I don't think that they would have allowed them to invest in any risky venture. Or if they allowed them to invest in uh, risky ventures, they would do proper due diligence to ensure that that risky investment like re real estate is, is worth it. Because we all know what is happening in the real estate uh, uh, okay. uh, sector. We are not getting okay. what we need to. But something, okay. my last point on this BOG right. issue is that mm. we need to amend the law on who becomes the leadership of BOG, the mm. directors of uh, uh, the, uh, who becomes a member of the board of directors of uh, uh, BOG. Because we can't take away the politics of the system. So we take away the appointment from the president? I think we should. And give it to who? I think we should. We should do institutional or, representation or, maybe they should be or vetted. set up they a should third be party in or maybe uh, vetted by the appointment committee of parliament to ensure that they are qualified. But even that, how, how I suspect... How does the vetting in parliament well, actually change that's anything? What, that's what I'm coming to. Even that, I have my own doubts, although I'm professing this Because parliament this, is this a partisan solution. thing. Well, but at least it's a representation of the people whose mm. monies you seek to protect. And who's, who's, who, who are the subject of but the But the majority in parliament will always have their way. Minority yeah, but, will but just but have that's their what say. I'm saying but they've been examined in public. The vetting will be screened. Yes, uh, majority will have their way. Mm. But you as the individual, you want... That does not divest the appointer or appoint... Uh, do, the one doing the appointment mm. from picking a party person mm. who may be qualified and getting the support of the party in parliament to well, endorse him. But that, that's okay. also true. That's, but, okay. that's just, what we need to All right, so, so we, we, we will take our next break, but uh, I want Evans to just finish up and then we end on this discussion. Okay, just